I want to welcome everyone to the Claude R. Hocott Lectureship in Petroleum Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And we have the pleasure of hosting Paul Pastusek, um, who's a drilling mechanics advisor in the Wells Technical Organization at ExxonMobil. His areas of expertise are automation, drill string dynamics, steerable systems, borehole quality, bit applications, cutting mechanics, and a whole bunch of other stuff, everything to do with drilling. He started out at uh, Baker Hughes, he was telling me about this morning, and um, got to ExxonMobil, I think, in 2009. He won the 2020 SP International Drilling Engineering Award, um, for which we're very proud that we have the, uh, the award winner here to speak to us. And um, he has a BS in mechanical engineering from that university over in College Station. <laughs> and an MBA from the University of Houston. And um, I'm not going to use up any more of his time, but just to say we're really excited to have you here, Paul, and um, you have the floor. All right. Well, thanks, John. Uh, let me see if I can uh, share my screen again, and we will, we will get right started here. All right, I can do this. Let's go back to slideshow from beginning. Come on, there we go. All right. Well, uh, appreciate the uh, the time for everyone. I, I have a number of topics that I uh, that I go through and and talk about. So one of the roles I'm in a in a group called Drilling Technical or uh, within ExxonMobil, and we provide the deep technical support for drilling operations around the world. So. Uh, my uh, my world is is everything on the uh, uh, on the uh, planet Earth. Uh, I've actually done a little bit of stuff with NASA on uh, for drilling for water in uh, on the Moon and on Mars as well. Uh, it turned out that uh, we didn't do any uh, we didn't do any uh, really big serious work, but at least you get a little bit of a uh, advisory role even for that. So anyway, all right. Well, let's. Uh, what I, I got a lot of topics that I can choose from, and the, and the one that I wanted to, to start with today was to talk about rig control systems and in particular the auto driller. I'm going to spend more time talking about auto drillers because they, they are not necessarily well understood and even by the guys that are really good controls experts that work for the guys like NOV and Worth and, and uh, Bintech and, uh, that write these systems. Uh, they are actually, uh, they're probably 100% time, 100 times better than I am on control systems, but they don't necessarily know the drilling process. So uh, it turns out I can teach them a little bit about drilling and they can teach me a little bit about control systems. And between the two of us, uh, we can uh, uh, make some real progress. And so I was talking to John earlier today about uh, playing in the other guy's sandbox. You know, if, if you, uh, um, if you, cross boundaries, if you cross the technical boundaries, uh, you'll find all kinds of opportunities. And I think that's true in almost everything we do. In drilling, you tend to be a drilling person or a production person or a completions person. And if you find out you, uh, you may uh, get to know one area really well, but if you'll get to uh, uh, find out what is in the other person's toolkit and, and what they do, you can usually be much more beneficial to uh, yourself and your company. So, all right, well, let's, uh, let's just uh, go through and talk about what's, what we're going to talk about. And I am, I am cramming uh, an hour and a half lecture into this hour. Uh, and I am, uh, I've hidden several slides because I just can't keep from talking about them. If I, if I show them, I'll talk about them. That's just the way it is. I'm, I apologize for that. But that said, uh, we're going to talk about just the physics of stick slip. And I said, oh, wait a minute, I was going to talk about auto drillers. But turns out that auto drillers affect the stick slip. So I'm gonna we'll figure out why, uh, which is really about rig control systems. Why do we even care? Uh, well, I'll show you a little bit about the theory of an auto driller, the way it works, uh, and in practice, what do we really do with auto drillers? There's there's uh, varying degrees of sophistication. Some of them you won't like at all. Uh, I I certainly hope, but not in this uh, this level of uh, uh, of expertise. You won't like what I'm going to show you, but it's out there right now. Uh, I, I want to talk about how the drilling system responds. You know, when you are controlling something, you always have a plant, some kind of a, a you, you're trying to control a variable that 
is out in the wild in the in the environment and so we're in this case we're going to talk about uh, the the drilling system the drill bit and the, and the rocks that we drill i want to talk about detecting dysfunction how do i know if it's my auto driller that's messing up or something else uh, and then i i've got a really simple uh, excel spreadsheet model of a drilling process with a with a little pi control loop in it and uh it, it uh, i wrote that uh, several years ago just to make sure that I understood what was going on on a couple of rigs that we had run uh, very specifically and, and it fairly faithfully executed what uh, what we saw so I think it's pretty right if you will uh, uh, talk about auto tuning you know if we uh, when you pick up the phone it just works you don't have to know a lot about how phones work and cellular handoffs and all that stuff wouldn't it be nice if the, we uh, uh, started an auto driller and just uh, we we uh, picked it up and it always worked and it never had any tuning issues or anything like that and that would be great so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, we're talking about multiple loops and control um, and the, and this is this starts to get a little more sophisticated in terms of, of the actual control systems uh, and then I'm going to spend only I only have two slides about heave compensation I just cut the rest of it out uh, we'll talk about uh, how heave compensation systems affect us in terms of stick slip and then active torsional damping systems. You may have heard soft speed, soft torque, revit, uh, flex torque. Actually, there's a Dover name. Z torque is the latest one uh, from Shell as well. So, uh, And then a few uh, takeaways and conclusions. So, all right. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, not share my screen here and and uh, I'm sorry to share my screen I will but I'm going to if I can do it right I'm going to quit sharing my um, video just so you can save some bandwidth so there we go um, all right so you know you know what I look like now anyway so and we'll I'll open that back up in a minute so let's look at stick slip um, you know, stick slip is often defined as a is a self excited limit cycle. So uh, you you start with just like you learn in uh, uh, like seventh or ninth grade somewhere in science class. You remember you had static friction and then you had dynamic friction. And the dynamic friction once you start sliding, the friction factor is less than it was when it was static. And uh, this guy Strybeck back around the turn of the century. Uh, came up and he said, hey, I can describe that as some kind of a, of a curve here where friction changes with velocity, uh, or in our case, torque changes with RPM. And um, this drop in, uh, in friction or drop in torque as I start to speed up uh, is what drives us into stick slip. Now, this part of the curve up here where, it, where as I try to turn faster, it takes more torque, that actually is a stabilizing zone. So this zone up here is stable, and, but this zone down here near zero is the unstable zone. Um, so if you think about uh, what you might see is, this is data from a well that we drilled in Piance, Colorado, so Rocky Mountains here in the US. Um, and uh, I'm just going to show you that, that, that this purple uh, or magenta color is one cycle of that stick slip limit cycle. Let's start at point zero right here. I have wound up approximately 25,000 foot pounds of torque. Oh, this is torque versus RPM, okay? So this is a bit RPM and this is surface torque. And um, so if you look here, I've, I've wound up about 25,000 foot pounds of, of, uh, of uh, torque and I'm setting at essentially zero RPM. At once, at, at a bit, at one second later, here I am, I'm turning 100 RPM, uh, and uh, it's about the same torque. By the way, this surface RPM, I'm turning 120 RPM, and this is an AC top drive, so it doesn't matter whether I've got 7,000 foot pounds or 25,000 foot pounds, it's going to turn 120 RPM or 119, 120. It's just, it's really stiff, okay? So here I am, sorry. I'm 25,000 foot pounds. I'm, I start to turn. I still have 25,000, maybe a little bit more because, uh, uh, because I'm turning the top drive as well. One second later than that, and we're here at this point too, I'm going 600 RPM. So 
I have unwound all that stored energy. I wound it up like a rubber band. I've, un I've unwound all that energy. Uh, and then at point three here, another second later, I'm back down to about 250. I'm still going faster than, uh, uh, than my surface. So I'm unwinding more torque, but it is slowing down. And then it finally, actually, in this case, I actually went to a negative 100 RPM, now only for a fraction of a second here. So it's not like I, I unwound several revolutions, but I go over here for a fraction of a second and then go to zero and a fraction of a second. And this uh, four, five, six uh, seconds, so it's about a seven, six or seven second cycle here going around this loop. Um, the blue lines are multiple cycles. That's just multiple stick, uh, stick and slip events, okay? And it's basically oscillating between this high stored torque and this lower uh, dynamic torque as I go through. All right, uh, so I can I can model that. Actually, it's not that hard. I can I can create a Strybeck curve and I can put a spring and a mass there and I can get this kind of behavior uh, pretty easily. And I can match if I know what the stiffness of the pipe is and the mass of the pipe and the BHA. I can get a pretty good uh, uh, feel for those things. Um, the problem is that it's more complicated than that. So uh, let's let's make let's break that curve down to a little bit more. Okay, first off, um, just like a fan viscometer, as I rotate the pipe inside of the borehole, the faster I rotate it, the more torque that it takes. That's just the shearing of the fluid. Remember, that's a positive thing. That's a that's a positive slope. We like that. That's going to help us in so suppressing stick slip. Um, is it enough to count, you know, could I, could I change the density or the shear of the fluid or something enough? The answer is no, but it's, but it is at least in the right direction. I'm not, I'm, I can't make an enhanced fluid, at least that I am know of, uh, that I could pump around the, uh, around the drill bit, in the BHA, because if I increase the shear strength of this material a lot, then of course it's, that's ECD and I don't want that. So, um, but here's my, here's my fluid. Uh, it's, it's increasing the torque as I speed up. Now, the drill pipe and the BHA, they are a friction. This is the Strybeck curve part of this thing. So um, again, I'm static friction, just rubbing against the borehole wall with the drill pipe and the BHA, it's, it's higher than the dynamic friction, okay? Um, and uh, you can see I'm gonna, I'm gonna add these components together. Now, it, it turns out there's a third effect. What about the drill bit? Oh, and by the way, I can have stick slip off bottom. I don't even have to have the bit engaged in the drill string. And, and, and that tells me that this, this dryback curve from the drill pipe friction is what's driving me, okay? So it doesn't have to be just at the bit for that to happen, okay? Um, all right, but I do have a bit effect. And recognize that the torque on the drill bit is proportional to the penetration per revolution, okay? Just like ROP, if you want. Uh, now, it, it depends a little bit on rock strength as well, but, but uh, for a given rock strength, if I double the ROP, I'm going to double the torque that it takes for the, the drill bit to cut. Now, it turns out the ROP, of course, or penetration revolution, is a function of weight on bit. So my drill bit curve, if I had a constant weight on bit at all these different RPM, then I would, I would have a flat line here, and it wouldn't really have a big deal. But what if I went from zero to 600 RPM in about one second, or I went from 100 to 600 RPM in one second? During that one second, I really spun up really fast, and my depth of cut, my penetration per revolution went down because I, I spun up all that stored energy, and I, and I don't even have time, to, if you will, fall into the well before I go. So in that event, in a situation like that, the drill bit slope is negative, and that's driving me to additional problems, okay? So this slope of this curve right here is dependent on the constant of weight on bit, how, how much the weight on bit varies or not. This is a function of the friction of the drill pipe against the borehole wall, and this is a function of the drill pipe in the fluid itself. Now I add all three of these together, and I come right back to that first curve that we did. That's that more complex Strybeck curve, but the cool thing is, I can break it into these three components and I get to play with these independently. You might imagine if I reduce the friction on the drill pipe, 
let's say I use lubricants or roller reamers or low friction stabilizers and all that stuff, if I take that curve, even if it has the same shape, if I bring it way down here, man, it's gonna have a lot less effect and the fluid's gonna have a bigger effect, right? So, so uh, I, I have methods to play with this. I don't, as far as I know, I haven't figured out a good, play, good way to play with the fluid properties that give me what I want without giving ECD, but we'll worry about that one. This one I can play with, and then the drill bit design up here, I can mess with this as well to get it to be less sensitive to weight on bit variation, is at the, so it'd be a flatter slope, okay? So the key thing that I want you to take away from this one is stip slip, yes, it can be a self-driven uh, uh, event, kind of a stip slip limit cycle, but it can also be driven by weight on bit variation. So it doesn't have to be just self-excited. Ooh, well, things get more complicated, right? All right, so why do I care about control systems? Well, it turns out, uh, I'm going to argue that stick slip is bad. I think most people agree with that. It's bad for drill bits, for BHAs, top drives. If I'm running as muthal tools in the ground and my RPM on my tool is zero and then 600, zero and 600, my MWD guys can't really tell me what my orientation is when it, when it was looking at the, the window of data, right? So it gets all smeared together. We've actually had to drill whole sections and then come back and, and just rotate through those whole sections. I would call it reaming, but we're really not intending to ream so much as just rotate off bottom uh, without stick slip, trying to, trying to be able to get the logging of the section on these real long wells. Well, uh, weight on bit variation adds to torque variation at the drill bit. Torque variation can excite stick slip. It's just like strumming the string on a guitar. It doesn't make any noise if you just let it sit there, but as soon as you as soon as you excite it, it starts making noise. And stick slips the same way. So if I've got to wait on bit variation, I can have torque variation. And stick slip can excite all these other modes of vibration. So I've got coupling between stick slip and axial and torsional and all the and lateral and all this. So, and I say vibration is bad, right? So stick slip's bad, vibration is bad, and stick slip can excite all these other modes of vibration. All right. So Let's, uh, let's look at what, what are we talking about uh, in terms of weight on bit variation. It can come from the auto driller. It can come from axial stiction. I'm trying to slide in the hole and, I, and as I, you know, I'm sliding and letting off weight, uh, it builds up until it releases and then it releases and I get this big you know, uh, surge event, if you will. Ax I'll call it axial stiction. Not a well-defined term actually in the industry probably at this point, but that's my term for it at least. Um, and then heave, of course. If, I've, if I'm on an offshore rig and the rig's going up and down, uh, I have weight and bit variation. Even if I do the very best I can, I've got some significant weight and bit variation. So let's, let's say I put 8,000 pounds weight, I get a certain torque from that drill bit, and that torque equals a certain pipe twist, okay? But if, it's, if it goes between eight and 12,000 pounds, I go, you know, oscillate between eight and 12, eight and 12. And that's actually pretty good to control. I've got this, you know, 1,500 uh, or maybe 1,300 or 2,100 uh, foot pounds of torque in this particular case. And for 5,000 foot of four and a half drill pipe, that's 140 degrees of pipe twist, okay? Pipe twist, a change in twist of the pipe with time is the same thing as a change in RPM. At with uh, right, so so this pipe twist change with time is the same thing as stick slip or a torsional oscillation. May not be full stick slip. It may not go all the way to zero, but it is a torsional oscillation. So, uh, well, that's a PDC drill bit. Let's put a roller cone in here. It has a it's a less aggressive drill bit. Everybody kind of knows that. Much less likely to stick slip. Why? Because for that same weight on bit variation, it only has this torque variation which is, you know, plus or minus or, or plus or minus 20 degrees, a, a spread of 40. So I can control the aggressiveness of the drill bit and control uh, stick slip. Now there are, there, I'm, another whole lecture, we can get into discussion. I can make the drill bit of a PDC come up and be aggressive and then match the curve of a roller cone uh, with, with little design features that I can stick on it. So I can change the aggressiveness of a PDC drill bit as well uh, to match closer to a roller cone and still drill fast and all the good things. Key thing is 
this Weddell bit variation is driving a torque variation, and that torque variation is driving a wind up and unwind of the drill string. And it's a function of how much weight variation I get, uh, which I have some control over, and the aggressiveness of the drill bit, which I have some control over. Okay. So again, this is why we're digging in deeper into all these uh, these details of how this system works. So, so if you think about vibration is bad, uh, there's really three rig control systems that affect stick slope. Auto drillers, we're gonna spend a lot of time on that. And again, weight on bit variation is a big deal. It turns out stalling events. If I, if I exceed on the auto driller, the stall torque, it just clamps the brake and doesn't let it feed off any at all. And then it waits until it all drills off all that energy and then it starts drilling again. And guess what that is? That's called weight on bit variation. So if I stall the, the uh, auto driller, if I hit the stall torque on the auto driller setting, it will also add to my stick slip problem. Uh, heave compensation system, good as they may be, there's always some residual weight on bit due to the friction and everything else. And then the top drive controllers. I have active torsional damping. Again, we talked about soft speed, soft torque, et cetera. Um, those those uh, are intended to get rid of that. And then of course, stalling of the top drive. If I ever, let's say the top drive is set to stall out at 40,000 foot pounds, I hit 40,000 foot pounds and so it stops rotating until things calm down or it'll, it'll reduce the RPM at the surface. And what did I just do? I just input a torsional pulse in the drill string going down, right? So not necessarily good. Uh, here's an example. Here is, uh, is uh, weight on bit right here in, uh, in this purple color, right? So um, if you look at, actually it's the, uh, I, I'll, I'll back up, it's the, uh, there's hook load in purple. So here's my hook load starts varying and you see how it starts to vary. In the upper part of the section, it was doing just fine, but it starts to, uh, to oscillate here on hook load, which is the same as weight on bit. And then here's my um, uh, torque. So look at what my torque starts doing. As soon as my hook load starts to vary, my torque starts to vary as well. And again, uh, I'm in this case, I am driving, because they're going both going together, I'm, uh, I'm driving the stick slip by the variation weight on bit. Hmm. Let's don't do that, okay? So, all right, let's, I, uh, I appreciate I'm going quickly. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm gonna take a break here in just a few minutes. So uh, we'll ask a question or two, but I, but I wanna get as much of this stuff in as I possibly can for you guys. So, um, all right, so let's talk about the theory of auto drillers. Uh, they can drill in ROP mode. And basically what I'm, the control mechanism, what I'm controlling is the speed of the drum. I'm winding up or unwinding the drill string on the drum. Okay, uh, if I'm drilling downward, I'm unwinding, of course. And because it's direct, I mean, if I rotate 27 RPM and I've got 12 lines strung in the, in the uh, derrick, then that, that turns out to be, you know, uh, 37 meters an hour, or pick a number, I don't you know. But, but the idea is I'm measuring directly the drum speed and I get exactly what the ROP is. And so it's a very, very closed loop control system and it's gonna be very stable. Now, the weight on bit's gonna vary as I drill through different rocks. So you watch here and my, uh, my little red dot bounces back and forth. It's what's happening is, is the ROP is constant because that's what I told it to do. And as I drill soft rock, the weight on bit goes down. If I go to hard rock, it goes up. So these slopes, you know, this, this slope would be the relationship between weight on bit and ROP for a, uh, a soft rock, it doesn't take much weight. A harder rock, it takes more weight for a given ROP. So this will be hard rock, soft rock, middle rock, right? So in weight on bit mode, okay, I have a weight on bit set point, right? And if the weight's too low, okay, I have a sensor that records the weight on bit from the drill string. Oh man, there's all kinds of errors in that system too. We can, another, another whole discussion on rig instrumentation, but here's my weight on bit as measured, best estimate I've got for it. And my, my target weight on bit was up here, it was over here. Well, I know I need to go up. So it says go up on ROP. If the weight on bit's low, then you should increase the uh, drum rotation rate. If the weight on bit's high, you should decrease the drum rotation rate. How much? 
you know, I'm, I'm rotating 27 RPM. Do I go to zero? Do I go to 15? What, what's my, what is my step size on the drum rotation speed? Man, all right. It turns out I have, <laughs> I have at least two control, basic control systems that are out in the world today. Uh, bang bang controllers or on off controllers. This is our, uh, think of your, uh, your thermostat on your air conditioning. If it's uh, 76 degrees in your house, it says turn that dead gum air conditioner on and stay on until it gets down to 74. And once it gets to 74, it says turn that off and wait until it gets back up to 76. So it just goes bang, bang. It's either on or it's off. And it's, uh, you know, that's, that's a bang, bang controller. Uh, there are, and we'll, we'll show you an example, there are bang, bang controllers on auto drillers as well. Um, why does it work so well in your house? I have a huge thermal mass and I have a relatively small system driving it and I can sense the temperature with the relatively uh, high accuracy. So I don't really have to worry about it. It's not like I way overshoot or undershoot or anything like that. So bang, bang controllers are simple and they're good for low mass systems with a lot of damping not drill strings, by the way, in case anybody's asking. So there's another controller, standard industry controller, PID control loops, right? PID, it's a proportional, uh, uh, has a, a, uh, a number that is associated with the proportional error, an integral term, which is gets rid of the long-term error and the derivative to keep it from overshooting. Um, it turns out, so in the, in the PID control world, the derivative term here, we don't use that on auto drillers. And it's because we have a really noisy system. So if you remember that if you have uh, noise in your signal and you take the derivative of it, the noise just goes completely uh, nuts. And so uh, trying to take a derivative of a noisy signal is a real problem. People have actually uh, done smoothing filters to get rid of the noise out of the noisy signal and then do the derivative from that. And, you know, but at some point you start to, to ask yourself if you're not, uh, you're, you're under responding because you, you smoothed out the signal to begin with. So today, uh, what I have seen is PI controllers, proportional and integral, propor uh, proportional and integral controllers, and they drop the D. All right, so let's do the bang bang controller. Uh, here is my uh, y-axis is as uh, ROP and wait a bit. So ROP is in, in uh, blue. It's either zero or it's, uh, I'll pick a number, 300 foot an hour. It's going to let off at 300 foot an hour until, uh, until I exceed my wait a bit and then it's going to go to zero and it's going to wait and then it's going to go back up and then it's going to go back and forth. And of course the spacing, if it drills slower, it might take longer to drill off and it might take a while before it drills off. So these, the, this is a pulse width kind of control system if you wanna think of it that way, right? All right, uh, so in, in a bang bang controller, I need a fixed dead band where I stay with whatever I was doing until I reach the other limit. So I need a, a min and a max weight on bit. This is now the Y axis in, uh, in green is, is the weight on bit and there's my min and my max. And over here uh, is my min and my max. So I'm drilling along like right here. And uh, if I'm in the middle, I, I keep doing whatever I was doing until I reach the upper weight and then I stop. Okay, so let's watch over here to the left. I'm drilling along and I, I, I start going 300 foot an hour and then I go to zero and then I go to 300. And this, by the way, this actually has some curvature to it. It, it looks more like a uh, an RC network uh, resistor capacitor. So it has a, a little bit of a curvature and a curvature to this too, but I just drew it as straight lines. Uh, my, uh, it was easier, that's all I can tell you. Uh, so so I, I go to 300 foot an hour, whatever my ROP set point is, I go to that until I get to the upper band and then I go to zero and I clamp the brake until I get to the lower band. And then an upper band and lower band and upper band and lower band. And you know what's really cool about this? The spacing between these things turns out to be on the order of five to 10 seconds. You know what the, net, the normal frequency for stick slip is? Yeah, five to 10, 15 seconds. 
it's it's naturally occurring. These bang bangs are occurring really nicely, overlapping with what my my fundamental frequency is for stick slope in a lots of cases. So so you might imagine a bang bang controller is probably the worst thing you want to do from a stick slope standpoint, and it is. All right. So let's don't do those anymore. Yes, I have rigs in the world today, right now, that ExxonMobil is running that have bang bang controllers on them. And yes, I am trying to get them uh, switched out. I don't even need to decommission the rig. I just need to change out the controller. It's not like I need to buy a new rig. I just need to upgrade the system. So, all right. Um, now, if I, if, if I, let's say I'm actually drilling at around here, around, uh, Let's say this is uh, 175 foot an hour. Instead of setting my, my point here to 300 and then zero and then 300, if I set it to 175 foot an hour, it would just come up and just you know kiss that ROP and it would just stay there all the time. Maybe I set it for 200. So if I, if I don't go way over my actual ROP, it will have a lot less variation. This, this system, Will, will be very slowly increasing, very slowly decreasing, because it varies between you know, 150 and 170, and 150 and 170, right? So uh, that's, the, that's the, uh, the logic of trying to adjust the ROP set point to be close to my actual ROP. We've running some trials around that as we speak. I've done some stuff that suggests that it works. Uh, more to be done on that. Uh, Better thing is for me is get rid of the bang bang controller. All right. All right. Well, let's look at our PID controller. And again, it's really a PI. So we 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 talked about this already. If the weight on bits low, increase the drum speed. If the weight on bits high, decrease. And there's really three terms here. You remember this uh, uh, PI control loop here? I've got a set point. Let's say thirty thousand pounds weight, and I I, I want to compare that to what I'm actually uh, uh, seeing here. So I've got this 30,000 pounds weight. I have a proportional constant here that, um, uh, that looks at um, uh, the error times that constant. The integral constant just says that over a long period of time, I'm going to look at, um, if, I, if I have this persistent error, it just gives that a little extra bump there to the, uh, to the uh, uh, controller's setting, if you will, in terms of ROP. So the output of the controller is drum speed or ROP, right? So I've got a, I've got a uh, an input for set point for weight. It goes through the little math here on these proportional constants, and it tells the drum speed I want you to turn at like 20, 28 RPM. Okay. The process is the drilling. This is the drill bit drilling into the rock, right? And and it does the same thing. If I, if I drill at 28 uh, uh, revolutions per minute of the, uh, of the drum, that equals 127 foot an hour, and that equals uh, you know, 37,000 pounds. And that's my output, and that's what it takes to drill that fast. And I say, oh, compare that 37 to the 35, and it's a little error, so it slows it down a little bit. And it just goes through this loop, all right? Um, Here's, here's the cool thing about that. Um, I'm, I'm going to watch this. This was a black box. So most, of, most of the drilling engineers are not controls guys. Uh, most of them, actually a lot of them are mechanical. A lot of our, our drilling engineers are mechanical. Some are, are petroleum as well. But most of them didn't really take a lot of control system stuff. So that black box, let's just gray it back out. And let's just say this, that the change in ROP is is a function of the gain of how big of a step you want to take. And it's also a function of the ROP range. So if I, if I have, uh, I'm trying to drill between zero and 300 foot an hour, I'm going to take a bigger step than if I'm trying to drill between zero and 30 foot an hour. Okay. All right. So the larger the gain, the, the larger the ROP uh, change, the ROP set point change. The, the faster the system is going to respond, but the more likely it is to overshoot. So if I increase this gain more, it's going to be more likely to overshoot. Okay. All right. So here's this little simulator I, uh, I wrote. It's uh, uh, here's time zero and it's, and it's slowly traveling across. I'll, I'll fire this thing up in a few minutes. But um, uh, this is a five minute window. 
uh, happens to match the window that I see when I look at one of the Omron control systems. Uh, Omron's currently owned by Slumberjay these days. Back in the day, it wasn't, it was independent. But, but what you see here is I was drilling along and I changed the weight on bit set point from 30,000 to 60,000 pounds. And it takes a long time. This is, this is one minute, two minutes. So it takes just right at two minutes for the ROP, it's slowly increasing ROP, 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 higher and higher until it finally reaches my weight on bit. So it, it took two minutes. That's a long time for me to, to uh, increase the, uh, uh, the ROP to meet that, that requirement, right? Uh, particularly would be really bad if it was on the other side. It, was, it needed to slow down and two minutes of drilling at real high weight on bit, that would be really bad, right? So. So uh, this, is, this is kind of a too long. It's a, uh, this one is, is much better, but you can see I'm unstable here. I, I responded, man, in a, I responded in a matter of about five seconds. I went from here's my, my step change, and I, I hit uh, because I went all the way up to the 150 foot an hour over here, and uh, uh, I went straight away to the max ROP that I would allow. And I overshot a little bit, and then I undershoot and overshoot. And this one, this one is right at the edge of stability. It's not. It's not going wild. It hasn't. It hasn't diverged with time. It has converged. But man, we're really, really close here on the edge of stability, right? Um, well, I'm. I'm kind of like Goldilocks. I don't want it too slow, and I don't want it too fast. I want it just right. Everybody remember. Uh, uh, Stigler Nichols, Nichols Stigler, is that right? Is that Nichols uh, uh, guys uh, talk about this? They uh, they say, look, what you know, critical damping would be actually critical damping would be one overshoot and then back down, and then this is just a little bit uh, over critical where you where you basically say I don't have no overshoot. I can allow either no overshoot at all, or I can allow one cycle overshoot, and, and which is the fastest possible settling time. But this is not bad. This is, you know, uh, this is 10 seconds. Well, I mean, that's two seconds. There's 10, you know, 15 seconds, something like that. Maybe uh, 15 or 20 seconds here, and I have I've stabilized out at my new RO, uh, my new weight on bit set point, right? So that's the just right. Okay. Well, what did I change to do that? It was that proportional gain factor right here, right? That that p factor. And I'm not going to get into the integral term today, I and mean, we can we can talk about how that needs to be tuned according to the uh, the system response, which includes how long the pipe is and how deep the well is and other things. And and of course the the system. Let's say I'm I'm sampling data every uh, one hundredth of a second. So every one hundredth of a second, it says, "Hey, you've got an error," and it says, "Oh." Well, 100 seconds later, you got another error. Well, it, it just says, change the ROP, change the ROP, change the ROP. If I do that uh, 100 times a second, obviously my physical mass doesn't move that fast. And so I need to slow it down. And part of that, part of that term of the tuning of the system is to, is to find out how much of a percentage of, of that error that I take in each one of those time steps. So uh, now, the, it makes sense that the weight on bit error over the weight on bit range. So let's say I've got a 10% error in, in weight on bit, right? That I would want to apply that to the ROP. Now, if my ROP range is, well, let's just call it zero is the minimum ROP and the maximum ROP is the ROP set point. Okay, that's what my controller knows. It knows what my min and my max ROP is. And it knows my minimum weight on bit is zero and my max is the weight on bit set point. And it says, okay, so, so I now know the min and the max, uh, and I'll just use that as a proportional error and then times the ROP range, and that's gonna give me how much I need to change the ROP, okay? Um, that's all cool, except this is, a, this is a percentage, but what happens here if it, if I, if I raise this gain too much, it basically it overshoots and it undershoots, right? It's just like we were at that edge of stability. We're gonna go uh, over and under. So we don't want that. Uh, if you think about it, the weight on bit error, I'm sorry, the, the 
ROP range, I can rearrange this. This ROP range over the weight on bit range, that term right here is the slope of this line, okay? The slope of that line is, uh, is dependent on the rock. It's real and, and, and the drill bit, right? If I, change, if I change drill bits or I change rock hardness, this line is going to change and that relationship is going to change. Hmm. Means I can't tune the auto driller in the factory somewhere and then have it go out and drill all these different rocks anywhere from 2,000 PSI to 20,000 or 40,000. In fact, uh, I use the same drill rig to drill six inch hole and 24 inch hole. I drill 45,000 PSI rock and 3,000 PSI rock. That's a 15 to one ratio. I, I run at 240 RPM all the way down to 60 or even less, right? I run roller cones and PDCs and everything in between and they have a five to one. If you multiply it, you'd multiply all of these factors together to know what my range of response between weight on bit and ROP is. Uh, it's, it's actually more than a thousand to one if you looked at all of those, but, it, but I'm just going to say for practical purposes, even, even within one well, it can be 200 to one. Okay, uh, if anybody knows anything about control systems, they're good. You, you kind of detune them so that they, uh, they operate even though the, the temperature outside might change or the plant might change a little bit, but very few PI control systems can handle a 200 to one range. It'll either be too slow and too sluggish or it'll be over responding, okay? And since that relationship's not fixed, then the, then the gain can't be fixed, okay? So what do we need to do? We need to get the, the rig to have gains uh, that they can see. They need to be trained on how to use them and how to recognize what's going on, right? Or even better, let's just auto tune that right up and get it rid of it, okay? So, all right, I, uh, I have time for about two questions and then we're going, to, uh, we're going to keep moving on so that I don't completely run out of time here. So any, uh, any questions, if you put those in the... Uh, uh, if you look in the chat, Paul, there's one question. Okay. Can you see that? Uh, hang on, I'm, my chat's not showing up. I, there we go, there was chat. Uh, From Mohammed. Yeah, let's see, PID control loop can't, we set the limits away so it does not touch zero, but a value lower than average to avoid stick slope. Um, you can you can set the upper limit on the weight on bit. Uh, you actually can't set the lower. You can tell it. You can you can say I would like you to maintain thirty thousand pounds, and it will it will oscillate up and down around the thirty thousand pounds. Uh, on the ROP limit, uh, a bang bang controller goes between on and off. It'll go between uh, three hundred foot an hour and zero or um, uh, you know, so it won't, it will not, uh, uh, I can't set the lower limit to be, let's say, uh, 150 to 175 and 150 to 175, not with a bang bang. I, if a more sophisticated controller could do that perhaps, but it, but it, then it needs to know what the upper and lower limit needs to be. Um, and a PI control loop does that more or less automatically. So, um, all right, well, let's, let's uh, go ahead and move on, I think. That's the key questions I got. Uh, how do we detect if this is a problem? And so here's a screenshot of a rig out in Arkansas. Uh, I'm looking at four signals here. ROP is in green, and the actual ROP and the ROP set point is, here's the green and the orange, okay? So that's, that's what's going on. The weight on bit controller is, is the orange right here. Uh, and the torque is blue, and so it's got nice, good torque control, and I'm tracking the ROP and the, and the, uh, um, uh, the weight on bit are tracking nicely to, to the set point. The delta P, this is a, a, a drill string with a motor in the hole, and the delta P is also relatively smooth, so the motor has got a relatively constant system. Uh, compare that to, here I have stick slip, and this, this is, uh, zero to 15,000 foot pounds of torque and I'm varying zero to 15, zero to 15, zero to 15. My weight on bit is actually controlling pretty well. So this is stick slip, but good weight on bit control. This is not the weight on bit controller's fault, if you want to call it that. 
it stick slip driven by something else. Compare that to this one. Uh, this is torque, okay? And here's the weight on bit, and you see the weight on bit starts to oscillate more and more and more, and as it does so, the torque and the, the goes up and down and up and down as well, right? Uh, and the R, well, the torque starts to go up and down, the, the ROP is going up and down, it's uh, overshoot, undershoot, overshoot, undershoot on the ROP, right? So, all right, uh, it can get really bad. Uh, here's my ROP, it's going all the way to, to zero, uh, in this case to 50, uh, 50 foot an hour, zero to 50, zero to 50, zero to 50, and you can see my differential pressure is going all over the place, and, uh, and my torque is starting to do the same. So this is, this is auto driller driven, and how do I know it's auto driller driven? Because uh, my, my ROP is, the drum is, is start, stop, start, stop, and my weight on bit is varying all over the place. Right? All right, here's a, this is, again, remember this is five minutes, uh, this is kind of cool because I have stick slip. This, these high variations in torque is stick slip. Uh, and then it goes away and then it comes back and it goes away. And it takes about a minute to come back and go away. And if you notice, it's timed with my ROP trace here. So I have a controller that is modulating stick slip. I have stick slip going on and I'm modulating the stick slip with the way the controller is working. Okay. Um, case from the Middle East where Here's my uh, uh, surface weight on bit starts to oscillate up and down, and when it does, the uh, the uh, torque starts to the surface torque starts to go up and down as well. Okay, uh, this one. How about this? Weight on bit, ROP, differential pressure, everything is going nuts. So yes, when everything paints the screen, it actually it turns out you don't know what caused what. In this particular case, we think, finally figured out what was going on is that somebody had put a filter capacitor in the uh, control loop so that it was supposed to be controlling according to differential pressure, but that extra filter that smoothed everything out also put a delay in it. So the, the, by the time it sensed the increase in pressure, it was already stalling and going nuts. So this was, this was a really bad situation to say the least. So um, I'm gonna show this video and uh, and then I think we're going to have to uh, uh, do a, a real quick. So let's see if this video plays. This is this is the a real time screenshot. We're we're drilling along. Here's my my uh, zero to a hundred foot an hour, zero to a hundred foot an hour. Okay, um, and you can see the variation in torque here. And what happens is you watch the drum. It lets off and it stops, and it lets off and it stops. Right. Not good. So even if I don't have any digital data or anything else, you're on a rig and you're listening to the drum and it squeaks and stops and then squeaks and stops. Uh, and you're out in Oklahoma, you can hear that for miles away. So um, uh, if you hear that, you know that they're having sticks up problem. If I lower the gain, what happens is I get this nice smooth feed rate. It's uh, the average ROP is the same. So Here's low gain, here's high gain, here's low gain. Notice that when I changed the gain during this high gain here, it took literally a matter of seconds for it to respond. So the cool thing is if I'm on a rig and I want to adjust these, what they call response tuning, if I want to adjust the gains, my result will show up in a matter of seconds. It's, uh, I don't have to wait days, I don't have to wait uh, hours or anything else. It should show up, if it is driven by the control system, it should show up very quickly. Okay. Um, all right. So I wrote a little spreadsheet to, to simulate this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, run this, uh, this video as well. Come on. Oops. I uh, don't know what happened to me there, but uh, it's, it, uh, it kicked me out. So let's see if we can get back on going on here. It's a bit like a, a bang bang controller on the presentation poll. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. There you go. With a 30 minute uh, time or a period. On it. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting is I don't have a clue why that went and kicked me out there, but we'll, 
we'll, uh, we'll let this get started back up again. There we go. I need to get back to that slide. All right, from current slide, there we go. Okay. Um, so you know, let, me, uh, let me just shorten this up because I'm gonna run out of time. I can, just like we said, we need to raise and lower the gain. I can, if I detect a dysfunction, I can see this dysfunction coming, I can automatically lower the gain on the system. So one of our, one of our really smart controls guys Basically, uh, I was explaining to him what was going on in the system. He said, hey, we write gain schedulers all the time. We can control that where if, it is, if it's oscillating like this, it will automatically lower the gain. So that if it detects this oscillation, it will slow things down like this. Um, now, uh, and that's actually pretty easy. It's, uh, you detect oscillation, you slow things down. I said, you know, how do we raise the gain back up? And the answer is, Actually, biology does the same thing, and that is it runs at the edge of stability all the time. So what, it, what he looks for is when it is too stable, when, it, when he never it crosses any boundary at all, or you've got an inner boundary, and if it never crosses the inner boundary, it will raise the gain back up. So it raises it up until it starts to get, get a little unstable, and then it lowers it back down. So, uh, and this system, it takes about uh, 10 or 20 seconds, and uh, there's, again, there's a minute here that responds. We've drilled through different formations. I drill from 10,000 to 20,000 and back to 10 or 5,000 PSI rock. And as I do that, my slope changes and this gain scheduler adjusts the gain to, to match that. So, um, okay, so uh, I, can, I can simulate the Auto driller, I can see how it goes unstable and I can create a, uh, a gain a scheduler to automatically control that. Until I do that, really what I wind up doing is putting on the rig floor a, um, uh, if you will, a poster about how to look, how to detect those dysfunctions and then what to do about them, right? Uh, just to let you know, things get a little bit more complicated um, I have a hook load sensor, so I have a PI control loop for weight on bit. I actually have a PI control loop for torque and a PI load control loop for standpipe pressure. And, and actually, because the drum is direct, this is a direct drum, drum feed to that. And I look at, at each one of these controllers and I say, am I exceeding hook load and if the, or weight on bit? And if the answer is yes, then it slows the drum down. Uh, if the answer is no, it says, am I exceeding torque? And the answer is no. If I'm exceeding standpipe pressure, the answer is no. Then it will, it will accelerate up to the drum speed that I told it, the max drum speed. Right? So it will, it will look at all four loops at all times um, and see how fast it can let off. It can let off. Uh, this is a multi-loop control system. Some, some are good at this. Others can only be in one mode at a time. It can only look at hook load or torque or standpipe pressure. I don't really like those as much as I do these multi-loop multi control systems. Um, and typically the loop in control is, is gonna be whichever one is closest to the target. So if the, the hook load is within 10%, and these are way off, it will, it will put the weight on bit in control and say, hey, I'm, you're gonna be my control guy, right? Uh, or if, the, if it's really close to the, uh, the ROP limit, it will use the ROP control. Uh, um, there's a thing called bumpless transfer. When I go from ROP mode to wait on bit mode and back and forth, I need to get rid of all the errors that were accumulated. Remember that integral term that we need? We got to zero out all that stuff or I'll, I'll wind up going and overshooting because of that. Um, Here's an auto driller running in ROP mode. ROP is constant and the weight on bit is going up and down. And then here it is in weight on bit mode where the weight on bit is constant and the ROP is going up and down, okay? Um, uh, same thing here, here's my weight on bit mode. 
And then uh, I drilled into something soft and I hit my ROP mode here first. So and the weight of bits below, below its set point because it hit the limit on ROP in that case. And then later it's back in weight on bit mode. Okay. All right. Um, I have, I know I have, ex, uh, I'm going to exceed my time if I go into any additional details and discussion. Um, so let me stop here uh, and then ask some questions. And uh, actually, John, John typed in me a, a little chat note that said the exact same thing. He said, Ben, you better, uh, you better summarize here. So yeah, that's a good time to talk. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and, and stop here and, and I will answer questions about the, the uh, uh, system that we've discussed so far. The key thing I want to- a broad question from Eric there, so. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the key thing I want you to take away is the auto driller controls a lot of the dynamics and you can detect whether it's auto driller driven or not. Um, can I talk about the uh, positive impacts that work had on drilling optimization? Yeah. So uh, it turns out that, again, all stick slip is not the same. If you, if you just take a generic, I have stick slip and I want to use a, a torsional damping system, it doesn't always work. It, it, a torsional damping system like soft speed, soft torque, it cannot overpower the uh, weight on bit system. If the weight on bit's varying because of the auto driller, you need to address the auto driller. So it's, a, it's really a factor of understanding what really is the root cause of your dysfunction. And, and that is true on just about everything we do. You, you really need to dig in and keep digging deeper until you understand it. Because sometimes people will say, well, you know, it worked last time. I just did the same thing I did last time. And, it, and this time it doesn't work. Last time it might have been stick slip driven by the drill pipe. Or in fact, I, I told you, it could be driven by the drill bit. It could be driven by friction. It could be driven by the auto driller. I, I used lubricants last time and it worked. I used lubricants this time and it didn't work well. It wasn't driven by friction on the drill pipe this time and it was last time, right? Um, if, if I have stick slip off bottom, changing the bit design <laughs> isn't gonna fix things, guys. You know, you, you, so you need to know which one of those is your driver. And in, t in fact, if you look really closely, the data is telling you that. It's there, it's built into that data of whether it's uh, driven by, by the bit or the uh, or the drill pipe or friction or whatever. So anyway, um, I have uh, I have a few minutes if anybody wants to hang out, but we're over our our time limit, and uh, and I appreciate your time. Hopefully that's answered a few questions. I will tell you that uh, again the the guys that write control systems for our rig vendors. Um, they know control system. I have no doubt at all. They know PI, PID control loops and, and gain scheduling and everything else. In many cases, they do not know about the drilling process itself. So if you can get and play in both areas, if you can understand both, uh, I think you win. I think you, you bring a lot of value to anybody that you go to work for. Uh, if you're working in your research project, uh, get to understand both parts of the system uh, uh, you know, from top to bottom, if you will. So any, uh, any other comments, John, or? Well, I would just say thank you, Paul, for, for a great talk. I appreciate it. I'll give you a high five there, but I think we have time for questions. So, um, if you have time and if people want to hang out, um, you can either, people can either unmute themselves and ask a question or type something to chat. Um, I'll wait a second. I have a question, but let me see if anybody else. Hey, Paul. Yes, as well. How are you doing? All right. Hey, as a, so when you guys contract your rigs, do you tend to say you want a PID controller or are you guys still getting bang bang controllers um, with your rigs or how does that work? Have, and then, yeah, I, so I have some rigs that are under contract in the Middle East signed the contract years ago and and I have asked, seriously asked to get those control systems upgraded. Even in the best of times, that particular procurement process and ExxonMobil is not, we're not the, we're not the principal uh, operator. We're, we're seconded off. Our people are actually working for the national oil companies there in the Middle East. And 
So our ability to influence things is less direct than it would be if it were direct. So unfortunately, yes, I still have some bang bang controllers in the Middle East right now. And, and no, am I happy about it? Absolutely not. Uh, and, and we can show the effect on performance and we can show them how bad things are. And it's bad for the drill rig too. Good gracious, man, your, your drill rig is getting these zero to 50,000 foot pound torque spikes. You know it's not good uh, for the drill rig as well as all the other equipment. So you would think they would be interested in upgrading, but it's money. It's, you know, uh, that's real money I have to spend versus uh, kind of uh, funny money that it's just extra maintenance that uh, I don't know if I have to spend it or not. Maybe the next guy gets to spend that. It's not me. So um, anyway. Um, so yeah. Paul, um, yep. so I was going to ask, you know, this is this whole, you know, the details of this are pretty new to me, but um, is drilling in the horizontal section fundamentally more stable because of drag than drilling vertical or? Well, yeah. I mean, as far as yeah. having these oscillations or? So there's, there's some good parts and bad parts. Turns out, so the friction, friction generally is not your friend. And uh, when, I, when I go out horizontal, so I drill out horizontal, what happens? Uh, I actually have axial friction. So my drill pipe, particularly in, in, I'm in slide, if I'm trying to slide, my drill pipe compresses, 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 and then it releases and I jerk forward and then it compresses and compresses and releases. So that axial stiction is really deadly for this event. So trying to slide in a, in a high angle home is really tough. Uh, it, it deserves low friction stabilizers of which I can have great discussion with you guys on. Uh, it deserves uh, really smooth taper angles on the ends of my stabilizers, no ridges, no anything like that super smooth boreholes that we use long gauge bits to make our boreholes more smooth. So there's a lot of things I can do that are not just drill rig related, but there's a lot of things that I can do to make that system uh, behave better. But high angle holes typically are, they're worse because of the axial stiction. They're also worse because I've got longer drill pipe, therefore a longer period more likely to have stick slip kind of things. So usually that's not my friend. So. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from those of you who are left in the audience? I have more questions, but I will save them for later when I talk to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> now go, go ahead and ask him. I bet you somebody yeah, else is going to ask that question. They're just embarrassed and, you know, they, um, don't, <laughs> they, they don't want to yeah. ask friends. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So if we go back to like the very, very, very beginning um, and this idea of, um, you know, how you're saying that if you're slipping, your, R, your RPM is going to be high, your DOC is going to be less, and you've got that variation weight on bit. Um, it was one of the first slides you had with the graphs on it. Sorry, everyone, for asking all the questions. Problem. No problem. It's probably this slide, right? Yeah, yeah, so it was this one here. Um, and then I think we might have spoken about this at some time before, but that idea, and it's one that you hear a lot of the, when, when you're sticking and then you're slipping and that idea of the, the drill string winding and unwinding. And I think I've spoken to you about this before, but um, a lot of people think, you know, when, when you're sticking, you're really digging in. And then when you're slipping, you're sort of coming back a bit in terms of weight on bit. Um, and I guess I was just after like an explanation of that or whether that's not really a thing at all. So uh, are you talking about shortening of the drill string sort of like- Exactly, I'm yep, yep, okay. yep. Um, so I've, um, I've been down a argument on whether the drill string actually gets shorter or not when I apply torque. And I have, uh, I have finally come down over many arguments with some uh, really smart people that I now really trust that the drill string does not get shorter when I, when I twist it because I'm, the, the torque that I'm applying is perpendicular to the direction of motion, okay? Yeah. Uh, I mean, to the axial direction. And, and if somebody says, ah, oh, but if I, if I were to draw a line on that drill pipe and then I twist it, 
the line just got longer. Yes, it did. And I, and I put energy into the drill string to make it longer. Okay, so the reason that the, the line got longer, what they're th tending to think is, hey, since the line got longer, what has to happen, the drill pipe has to get shorter in the axial direction as I mm -hmm. wind. Uh, if you just take, my, my argument is I applied a shear to the drill pipe and, and the shear was perpendicular to the, uh, to the axial direction and does not have an effect on the axial thickness now, or the, the, uh, the axial displacement. Uh, my analogy is take a deck of cards, lay them on the table, draw a vertical line on them, and then shear the top of the deck so that it is now um, uh, sheared. The line is yeah. longer than it used to be, but the, but the deck of cards did not get any shorter from top to bottom. Now, I'm going to tell you how that is what I believe is true if it's just pure mechanics, but then I'm going to break that rule with one thing, and that is if I'm in a curved hole, and so I've got my pipe laying in the hole and it's got curvature to it, and I wind it up, it can certainly pick up and, and, and go uh, follow a more curved path in the borehole. In fact, mm -hmm ever goes into sinusoidal or torsional buckling, helical buckling, it gets radically shorter quickly because, yep. of, because of the geometry. So, so there's, a, there's a buckling slash geometry effect that is really big. And there is a materials effect that most people think about. They think about it being materials. And uh, my smart guys that work for ExxonMobil have convinced me that there's nothing there. Uh, and that, is, that argument has been in the industry for a long, long time. So I'm sure me saying so is probably not going to make it go away. Um, but uh, but uh, I currently believe that there's no effect due to the shear of the pipe or twisting of the pipe, except for how it affects the geometry, the way it lays in the bottom of the hole, which is a big effect. That's a big number. Not perfect. That's, I mean, because I've heard that one a lot of times as well, that idea of it lengthening and shortening. So it's good to just get some clarity on that. Take a deck um, of cards and slide it and, and use that as your example. <laughs> and ask, it's a uh, ask no. whoever, your whoever name poker game. How, how shearing the pipe, because that's what I'm doing. I'm applying yep. towards the pipe, which is a shear force, and how shearing the pipe is any different than shearing that deck of cards. And I, my argument is, yep, yeah, that's the that's the best analogy that I have for that. So, Paul, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and excuse myself. I have another Zoom to go to in a minute, and I want to thank you again. And everybody wants to thank you again for your time. Um, Y'all are welcome to hang out on Zoom for a little bit. I think. Well, Paul's a co-host, so I think the after I leave, the session should persist. But. Um, but uh, thank you again, and we really appreciate it. Hope to, hope to see you in person soon. You bet. You're, you're most welcome, and uh, I enjoyed this. So uh, I hopefully I picked a topic that people are interested in, and uh, it's useful. It was, it was great, and thank, thanks to Eric for suggesting you as a speaker. So. Yeah, you bet, man. All right. Bye.